It's Tuesday, April 14th, 2015, and this is Episode 9, The Riff Raff and Rand Paul Edition. And on this fortnight's episode, are Rand Paul's positions really libertarian in nature? We also talk about what's in the news, the RFRA, and some phone apps that can keep your phone calls and text messages out of the hands of the NSA. Welcome to The Lava Flow, channeling the flow of information to the libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, and agorist community. Find us at thelavaflow.com. Here's your host, Roger Paxton. Thank you for joining me. Coming to you from Lava HQ, flowing from the state that is the home of the Double Decker Outhouse at the Booger Hollow Trading Post, this is the show that will bring you the people, places, and events that everyone in the Liberty Movement needs to know. You can catch me on Twitter at the Lava Flow Pod. Now, let me tell you what's rustling my jimmies this week. Let's do it to it. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act called RFRA for short, or as I like to call it, Riff Raff, has been all in the news lately, primarily because of Indiana. But the Arkansas legislature made sure that we looked just as ignorant here as they did in Indiana. In Arkansas, anyway, it all started in a town called Fayetteville, where an anti-discrimination ordinance was passed last year. The ordinance essentially said that landlords and businesses could be prosecuted for unjustly evicting or firing someone because of their sexual orientation, gender identity, socioeconomic background, etc. Ironically, an amendment was added to the ordinance to exempt all tax-exempt properties and places of worship owned by a church from being included in that ordinance. That amendment to the ordinance failed, even though the full ordinance did pass. Also, ironically, in a special election last December, after a petition that received more than 5,000 signatures, this ordinance was repealed fully by the citizens of Fayetteville. To continue their track record of making Arkansas look like the most backward state in the Union, our Republican-controlled legislature in Arkansas thought that they needed to protect a special class of citizens, those who are religious, by passing the riffraff. Walmart the largest employer in the state, asked Governor Asa Hutchinson, who they gave $12,000 to for his campaign, to veto the bill. Even Hutchinson's own son asked him to veto this bill. Well, instead of vetoing or signing the bill, which would have taken some balls, he sent the bill back to the legislature to be rewritten to make it more tolerant. The legislature finally, a few days later, sent back a bill that essentially mimicked the federal riffraff, and the governor signed it into law. Keep in mind, the federal riffraff was designed to protect the rights of Native Americans to smoke peyote as part of their religion. Now, I say that if you can smoke peyote as a Native American, you have the same right to do so as an atheist. Protecting this right only for one group of people is immoral. Now, let me frame this properly. No one has a right to one second of my time, one jewel of my energy, one iota of my labor, or one ounce of my property, except for me. In Atlas Shrugged, John Galt said, I swear by my life and my love of it that I will never live for the sake of another man, nor ask another man to live for the sake of mine. Now, I discriminate every time I do business. So do you. So does everybody. For example, I don't shop at a store that has a Jesus fish, a menorah, a crescent, or some other religious marking. I don't want to give my money to a company that supports things that I find disagreeable. Why would I want to? Since I obviously have the right to freely associate with any business that I want to, why doesn't the shop owner have that exact same right? Rights are universal, or they are not rights. If I have the right to choose who I associate with, then the shop owner must have the same right. My biggest issue in this entire debate is that it's only the bigoted shop owners catching flag here, and not the people unjustly wielding the force of the state against a peaceful yet bigoted store owner. Of course, bigoted shop owners should be boycotted and ridiculed, absolutely. But so should those who would use the force of the state against peaceful citizens. 
Everyone dances around the fact, or just blatantly ignores it, that anyone who would call for a law to force shop owners to associate with those they do not want to associate with are, essentially, supporting state force and aggression. Now, I would respect these people a lot more if they would just be honest about it and say, I want the government to threaten to kick that guy's ass if he doesn't bake me a cake. And if the threat of force doesn't work, then I want men with guns to go into his shop and beat his ass, kidnap him, and lock him in a cage. Make no mistake about it, this is what we are dealing with. What is more egregious, discrimination or force? Force is, without a doubt. Look, there is no such thing as gay rights, black rights, business owner rights, Christian rights, etc. There is only individual rights. As Ayn Rand said, the smallest minority on earth is the individual. Those who deny individual rights cannot claim to be defenders of minorities. Creating a protected class under the law is immoral. All rights belong to the individual. And let's not forget that it has historically been government who has been responsible for more discrimination than anyone. From slavery to Jim Crow to blocking interracial marriages. From banning gays in the military to creating protected classes who can discriminate against gays to gay marriage. This is nothing new. The same arguments and the same Bible verses we are hearing today are the same arguments and the same Bible verses we heard a few decades ago that led then-Governor of Arkansas, Orville Phobos, to calling out the National Guard to block the entrance of nine young black people to go to school at a white school in 1957. We make fun of these people now. We know they were on the wrong side of history. The way our youth are growing up to be pro-LGBT it will take much less than a few decades for people to make fun of this. If my eight-year-old son gets it, why doesn't the generation ahead of ours get it? Exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per-episode donation of as little as a buck an episode. Or use Bitcoin. Get exclusive content, rewards, and help the lava flow become fiscally neutral while providing you more content. TheLavaFlow.com slash support. What's in the news? The news you need to know from a libertarian perspective. There has been a lot of news since the last episode of The Lava Flow, so I'm going to just jump right into it. And it's about time to get some good news out of Washington. On April 2nd, a nuclear deal framework with Iran was announced. If the deal receives congressional approval, Iran would reduce its stockpile of low enriched uranium by 98% and significantly scale back its number of installed centrifuges. In exchange, the United States and the European Union would lift sanctions that have crippled Iran's economy. Of course, congressional Republicans are taking a hard stand on this. This is pure political prick-waving, and it is a disgrace. If George Bush had brought this deal to Congress, the Republicans would be crawling all over themselves to be the first to shake his hand and congratulate him. And it would be the Democrats taking the hard stand. As Sheldon Richmond said, We are a little further from war today than we were before this framework. I'm pretty sure this is something that every libertarian can appreciate. In Why Is Anyone Surprised News, it was revealed that the U.S. government started keeping secret records of Americans' international calls nearly a decade before the September 11th attacks. For more than two decades, the Justice Department and the Drug Enforcement Administration kept logs of virtually all telephone calls from the U.S. to as many as 116 countries linked to drug trafficking, including Canada, Mexico, and most of South and Central America. These records were used to track drug cartels' distribution networks and were even used to help rule out foreign ties to the 1995 bombing of a federal building in Oklahoma City. The DEA program did not intercept the content of calls, but the records of which numbers were dialed and when. 
The DEA did this using help from military computers and intelligence analysts. Mark Rumold of the Electronic Frontier Foundation said this was aimed squarely at Americans. That's very significant from a constitutional perspective. This program was finally halted in September of 2013 amid the fallout from Edward Snowden's revelations about other surveillance programs. I've said it before, and I will say it again. Edward Snowden is a hero. We need a statue placed somewhere in honor of him. In We Need a Statue Placed Somewhere in Honor of Edward Snowden News, a four-foot-high bust of Edward Snowden was installed in Fort Greene Park in Brooklyn by several artists who spent more than a year creating it. Within hours, the Parks Department had covered the illicit bust with a tarp and began removing it. Measuring four feet tall and weighing in at 100 pounds, it was placed in the park in the wee hours of the morning to avoid notice. Over a dozen people walked past the new bust without noticing the unsanctioned piece. The artists say that with the material used and the amount of work involved, a bust like this would cost around $30,000. Being fully aware of the bust's eventual destruction, the artists left themselves a few options, including one that involves deploying an army of many Snowden heads. Quote, we have a full-size mold that can be poured again, and it's been 3D rendered, so we have the ability to print smaller ones at scale, they said. In the dumbest idea in Congress since the last idea they had, Representative Rhoda DeLauro, a Democrat from Connecticut, will be introducing the Support Assault Firearm Elimination and Education in Our Streets Act which will provide up to $2,000 in tax credits for gun owners who voluntarily hand in their assault weapon to the local police. No mention of the fact that, as more and more states have become concealed carry states and a handful have enacted constitutional carry, gun violence is at a 20-year low. Also, no mention of the fact that so-called assault weapons are used in less than 1% of the crime in this country. If this passes, I will be starting a new career, and you won't hear me on the lava flow anymore. I will be purchasing cheap, broken, or otherwise damaged assault weapons for a couple of hundred dollars, turning them in, and cashing in at $2,000 per unit. It doesn't take a genius to figure this out. In Here We Go Again news, Officer Michael Slager of the North Charleston, South Carolina Police Department shot and killed 50-year-old Walter Scott. Firing eight shots, five of which hit Scott in the back, Officer Slager has been charged with murder. Immediately after the shooting, the officer began lying about what actually happened, saying Scott was trying to take his taser from him, so he feared for his life, which led to him shooting Scott. A video taken by a bystander shows the truth, that Scott was running away from Slager and was posing no threat at all to the officer or anyone else. When Scott was about 15 feet from the officer, the officer opened fire into Scott's back. A few hours after the event, the officer's attorney said that Slager followed appropriate policies and procedures. The following day, after the video had been released, the attorney said he no longer represented Officer Slager. Good call. Officer Slager has been charged with murder primarily due to the video evidence, and could be facing life in prison or the death penalty. If there was not video of the incident that I just talked about, this officer would likely have the police unions and his commander supporting his false story. Since there was video from a concerned citizen, he is now behind bars. Record every police encounter that you have. Record every police encounter that you see. It is imperative to bringing down the police state. In March of 2015, 111 people died during police encounters, up 36 from the previous month of February. This is one every six and a half hours. This is twice as many as the UK had in the entire 100 years of the 20th century, and we did it in a month. This is an epidemic that must stop. And who could have seen that coming news? Rand Paul announced his candidacy for president last week. 
The senator who won election in 2010 as a Tea Party candidate said, quote, Today, I announce with God's help, with the help of liberty lovers everywhere, that I'm putting myself forward as a candidate for president of the United States of America. Now, as I'm sure that you can imagine, I have lots to say about this. I'll be going over this in depth in my Statists Gonna State segment coming up later in this episode. And cap apps. Open Whisper Systems is a company whose mission it is to make private communications simple. They do this by making open source software for Android and iPhone that secures your phone calls and text messages using encryption. At this point, they have three applications out, so let's take a look at these. The first app is Redphone for the Android. Redphone provides end-to-end encryption for your cell phone calls, securing your conversation so that nobody can listen in. Redphone uses your normal phone number to make and receive calls, so you don't need yet another identifier. With this app, you can make calls using the default Android phone dialer and contacts app just like you normally would, and have the opportunity to upgrade your call to an encrypted call whenever you want during the call. These calls are encrypted end-to-end, so the call cannot be listened to anywhere between the phones, yet the calls function just like you're used to. Both participants in the conversation must have Red Phone installed on their phones in order to activate a secure call. The next app is Text Secure for the Android, and it encrypts your text and chat messages. This app replaces the default text messaging app on your Android. All of your messages are encrypted locally. So if your phone is lost, your messages will still be safe. All of your messages to other TechSecure users are encrypted over the air, protecting your communications in transit. The Signal app is where it will all be going. Right now, Signal is a secure app for encrypted phone calls and text messaging for the iPhone. Signal was designed specifically for mobile devices, using a jitter buffer tuned to the characteristics of mobile networks and using push notifications to preserve battery life while still remaining responsive. Signal is also free and open source software, allowing anybody to audit the code for correctness to help contribute improvements to the software. The project even pays out a percentage of donated Bitcoin for every merged pull request. Currently, Signal can also make calls to the Android app Redphone securely. Signal will be a unified private voice and text communication platform for the iPhone, Android, and the browser. Later this summer, Signal for iPhone will be expanded to support text communications compatible with Text Secure for Android. Shortly after that, both Text Secure and Redphone for Android will be combined into a unified Signal app on Android as well. Simultaneously, browser extension development is already underway. If you are tired of the NSA knowing every single communication that you send, I suggest getting these apps now. They are all free and open source and are must-haves in our current world of government surveillance. I have personally tested the iPhone app, Signal, and it works perfectly. Have you subscribed to the Lava Flow on iTunes or any mobile device yet? Then what's wrong with you? Go to thelavaflow.com slash subscribe so you don't miss a minute of the show. And while you're subscribing, make sure to leave me a five-star rating and review the show to help others find our podcast. Thelavaflow.com slash subscribe. As I mentioned earlier, Rand Paul has thrown his hat into the ring for the presidential race of 2016. I think this is great for Republicans. For Libertarians, party affiliated or not, it is only going to serve to confuse the term libertarian that has already been watered down and bastardized by the media, Glenn Beck, 
and other, quote, libertarian conservative candidates. We already had the term liberal stolen from us by the left. Now the right is trying to steal the term libertarian, and God damn it, it has got to stop. I was asked on the We Are Libertarian show last week if Rand Paul is a libertarian. Here's a little bit of that discussion. If Rand Paul is the nominee for president, should Gary Johnson be in the race for president as the Libertarian Party nominee? 100%. One hundred percent, and for several reasons, but primarily because the LP relies on that presidential candidate for ballot access in a lot of states. So, for example, in Arkansas, for us to retain ballot access uh, for the Libertarian Party, the only way we can do that is by getting either three percent for the president or three percent for the governor. In twenty sixteen, we don't have a governor running. It's that's in twenty eighteen. So, for states like us, it's absolutely imperative that we have a candidate running. Um, not only that, but also to bring, you know, notoriety and, and information to the people from the Libertarian Party. I mean, they need to see an active Libertarian Party. <clears throat> but number two, because Rand Paul isn't a Libertarian. That's the primary reason. Okay, explain that. Well, I don't have to. Rand Paul will explain it to you. He says he's not a Libertarian. Nowhere on his literature, on his website, nowhere in his speeches will you hear him say he's a Libertarian. He's been asked if he's a Libertarian, and he says he's not. Everything says he's a conservative. He is absolutely a conservative. He's not a libertarian. Um, now, he does hold some libertarian ideas. I'm certainly not saying that. And I do believe that of the top people running right now between him, Bush, you know, all of those others, he would without a doubt be the best of those. Right. But he, he's still not a libertarian. Yeah, he's still the lesser of, of the evils. The prettiest ugly girl at the ball. <laughs> right. I mean, I would not be upset to have him as president because, like I said, he is much better than everybody else. But if it were between him and, and Gary Johnson, Gary Johnson's got it. What are some of the aspects where they differ? I mean, what are some of the things that they disagree on? Well, Rand Paul was against drone strikes before he was for them. I mean, that's one thing. Uh, you know, he flip-flopped on that. He's very interventionist. Of course, he signed the Tom Cotton letter that drew so much ire um, from, from everybody. He signed it along with Ted Cruz. You know, if, if that's his idea of non-intervention, then wow. I mean, I don't even know what to say about that. Uh, let me challenge you on that. I mean, if if... The Iran deal was signed today. Uh, we are recording this on April second, two thousand fifteen. A framework, a framework was, was agreed upon. Yeah, yeah. And there was right. no deal. The deal will take June thirtieth. Uh, yeah. is when it's expected to be signed and delivered. Uh, so it isn't negotiating better than bombs. I mean, and that was sort of what Rand Paul was arguing, wasn't it? The the Tom Cotton letter was designed to do one thing: to interfere in those talks. That's it. The neocons in Congress and in the Senate do not want talks going on between the White House and Iran. It's that simple. That letter was ju was designed to disrupt those talks. Nothing, nothing more. Okay, so uh, the, he also f flip flopped on defense spending. Rand Paul did. Uh, can can one of you two nerds explain what exactly happened with that? Well, his <laughs> now his office came out and said he didn't really flip flop. They said, well, what he's trying to do is stick it to those conservatives who want to increase defense spending without actually paying for it. So he threw his own bill in, increasing the uh, the defense spending quite a large margin, but showing cuts in other areas how he was going to pay for it. But I'm sorry, I just I don't buy that. I mean, his dad used to do the same thing, putting in bills that had um, you know showing how to pay for it and whatnot, but he never increased the defense spending doing it. He yeah, he did increase the military budget, but he offset every um, every expenditure with cuts to. And this is the danger of what he did and in his budget to social programs and various other governmental programs. It, it's it was not, in my opinion, a strategic move because it allows Cruz and Rubio, who are his main um, antagonists in the in the debate, to position themselves as compassionate conservatives over Rand Paul, who really just wants to watch poor people starve. Right. It's very clear that Rand is not a libertarian for many reasons, but primarily because, as I said in that clip, he himself refuses to identify as a libertarian. In an interview with Time Magazine in March of 2010, he said, and I quote, They thought all along they could call me a libertarian and hang that label around my neck like an albatross, but I'm not a libertarian. Now, this is an exact quote of what he said. Not only did he say, I'm not a libertarian, but he compared being called a libertarian to an albatross, which is a term used metaphorically to mean a psychological burden that feels like a curse. This could not be more clear. 
So since it's clear that Rand does not consider himself a libertarian, let's look at his positions to see if he acts like a libertarian. First, we will look at his flip-flops. Yes, this brings back images of John Kerry, but if you can get that awful image out of your head for a minute and go on this journey with me, that would be great. In 2010, in an interview with the Louisville Courier-Journal, Rand Paul famously made the case that the 1964 Civil Rights Act was not a good thing for private businesses. He said, I abhor racism. I think it's a bad business decision to ever exclude anybody from your restaurant. But at the same time, I do believe in private ownership. Most good defenders of the First Amendment will believe in an abhorrent group standing up and saying awful things. Now, this was dead on from a libertarian perspective. However, in April of 2013, at a speech at Howard University, he said, No Republican questions or disputes civil rights. I've never wavered in my support for civil rights or the Civil Rights Act. Now, not only is this a lie, since he is on video not supporting the Civil Rights Act, but it is a complete 180-degree turn from his stance in 2010. Now that's a flip-flop. In an interview with Alex Jones in 2007, Rand Paul said, I think people want to paint my father into some corner, but if you look at it intellectually, look at the evidence that Iran is not a threat, Iran cannot even refine their own gasoline. Over 50% of their gasoline is imported from Europe. Also in 2007, he said, Even our own intelligence community consensus opinion is that Iran isn't a threat. Like my dad says, the Iranians don't have an air force, they don't have a navy. You know, it's ridiculous to think they're a threat to our national security. However, he said in his announcement speech just last week, I will oppose any deal that does not end Iran's nuclear ambitions and have strong verification measures. So let's get this straight. Iran cannot possibly be a threat to us, so we should continue crippling their nation with sanctions? This makes no sense at all. Rand has also flip-flopped on foreign aid to Israel. In 2011, he proposed a budget that would eliminate foreign aid to Israel, saying, While this budget proposal does eliminate foreign aid to Israel, it is not meant to hurt, negate, or single out one of America's most important allies. This proposal eliminates all foreign aid to all countries. Israel's ability to conduct foreign policy, regain economic dominance, and support itself without the heavy hand of U.S. interest and policies will only strengthen the Israeli community. However, in August of 2014, he said, I haven't really proposed that in the past. We've never had a legislative proposal to do that. You can mistake my position, but then I'll answer the question. That has not been a position, a legislative position, we have introduced to phase out or get rid of Israel's aid. Again, another clear lie. And on vaccines, which I discussed at length in Episode 5 of The Lava Flow, The Rage Against the Vaccine Edition, which you can find at thelavaflow.com slash 5, Rand Paul said in February of 2015, I have heard of many tragic cases of walking, talking, normal children who wound up with profound mental disorders after vaccines. I'm not arguing vaccines are a bad thing. I think they're a good thing. But I think the parent should have some input. The state doesn't own your children. Parents own their children. And it is an issue of freedom and public health. A day later, he said, I did not say vaccines cause disorders, just that they were temporally related. I did not allege causation. I support vaccines, I received them myself, and I had all of my children vaccinated. But yes, he did absolutely imply that vaccines caused profound mental disorders. So we've looked at a few of his flip-flops, and I know what you're thinking. Everyone changes positions on some things, right? Well, sure. I mean, I've changed positions on many things from my card-carrying neocon Republican days of long ago, But I have a valid, explainable reason for changing positions. And so does Rand Paul. Every position he has flip-flopped on has been from a strong libertarian stance to a stance that is much more palatable to moderates to make himself look more electable and to gain more votes. Now, let's look at some other positions Rand has been public about. The man endorsed Mitt Romney for president in 2012. Enough said. He does not support closing Guantanamo Bay where many men are being held illegally and not receiving due process and civil rights is non-existent. 
He does not support the legalization of marijuana or ending the drug war. He did co-sponsor a bill to protect medical marijuana patients from federal protection only in states where it's legal, but told a group of ministers in 2013 that he did not support full legalization of marijuana. This means that he supports the drug war. He proposed a bill just last month increasing defense spending by $190 billion, as if we need more spending in the defense budget. He co-sponsored a bill called the Life at Conception Act, which would have outlawed all abortion across the nation. I am not an advocate of abortion by any means, but we certainly do not need federal laws outlawing abortion. Rand Paul is against same-sex marriage. He made the case in an interview with Glenn Beck that deviating from traditional marriage could lead people to marrying animals. Come on. He also said that marriage should be left up to the states, saying, quote, I think right now if we say we're only going to have a federally mandated one-man, one-woman marriage, we're going to lose that battle because the country is going the other way right now. If we're to say that each state can decide, I think a good 25, 30 states still do believe in traditional marriage. And maybe we allow that debate to go on for another couple of decades and see if we can still win back the hearts and minds of people. So basically, he is saying that he doesn't support a federal marriage amendment only because it could lose. So he supports keeping that debate going strong by using state amendments. I guess he just doesn't realize that tyranny is still tyranny at the state level, not just the federal level. Despite his 13-hour filibuster protesting only a limited, non-existent scenario of a targeted killing order against a U.S. citizen on American soil, he does support the use of drones in targeted killings overseas and the use of drones on U.S. soil as part of a broader border security effort. He said he would imprison people who listen to radical political speeches or attending speeches from someone who is promoting the violent overthrow of our government. Now, this is one you have got to listen to to believe. Now you set yourself up to be called a bigot because now you want to profile people at the airport. <laughs> well, no, you can't win, Rand. I mean, I know, they, I know, they've got but, an answer for everything. <laughs> but here's the thing, Sean, is I'm not for profiling people on the color of their skin or on their religion, but I would take into account where they've been traveling, and perhaps you might have to indirectly take into account whether or not they've been going to radical uh, political speeches by religious leaders, but it wouldn't be that they are Islamic. But if someone is uh, attending speeches from someone who is promoting the violent overthrow of our government, that's really an offense that we should be going after. They should be deported or put in prison. Rand Paul supports airstrikes against ISIS. Now, I am not saying that Rand Paul does not have some issues where he is in line with libertarians, because he does. He opposes the Patriot Act, the NSA, the TSA, and the NDAA. These are all great stances. Keep in mind, though, that Obama has some issues where he is in line with libertarians as well. But no one would dare call Obama a libertarian. So why are we calling Rand Paul one? The best that Rand Paul supporters can come up with is that he is apparently lying about his principles to get more votes. Then somehow he will miraculously become more libertarian once he gets into the White House. If this is true, which I very much doubt, this makes him just like every other politician out there. A liar who will do anything, even compromise his principles to get votes. If this is the best that his supporters can come up with, then they can have him. But would I be upset if Rand Paul won the presidency? Not really. I mean, looking at the other declared candidates and those likely to declare in the two major parties, he is probably the best of all of them, no doubt. If he were to win, we would possibly see more freedom in some areas of our lives. We would also likely see less freedom in our lives in other areas. But I do concede that, at least compared to most presidents of my lifetime, he would potentially be the best. Does this mean I won't continue working to elect a real libertarian president through a real libertarian party? No. Depending on who the nominee is that comes out of the Libertarian Party convention, I will likely support that candidate. Unless, of course, the LP puts up another team like Bar Root. Thank you for listening to the show this week. As always, I need to thank my beautiful wife, Jessica, for her help with this show. 
and Sheltered Life for allowing me to use their music. I also need to thank Trevor this week for going to thelavaflow.com slash support and flexing his free market muscles by supporting the show with a per-episode donation. Thanks so much, Trevor. For the show notes to this episode, where I put links and information that has been on this show, go to thelavaflow.com slash nine. I also have links to every position that I talked about Rand Paul having in the Status Going to State segment above, so go check that out. I've received a few more iTunes reviews recently. Greggy B said, If you are tired of listening to the typical agenda of the other two major parties, I would recommend trying the Lava Flow. I find it very interesting and a nice change of pace. V says, I've listened to several libertarian podcasts, and this one is a welcome addition to that list. It has a very cerebral feel. The host has a calm and clear voice. There's no ranting or righteous anger. The content includes some current events and information that libertarians, especially anarcho-capitalists, can make use of. I'd recommend it to anyone who wants to listen to a quality podcast with a libertarian slant. I appreciate it so much, guys. Thank you. Your reviews help give me the energy to keep going and help spread the word about the show. But most importantly, if you like what this show gives you and you want more of it, and to keep this show ad-free, exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per-episode donation of as little as a buck an episode using Patreon. There are monthly costs associated with doing this show, and I need additional equipment to continue making this show better for you every single episode. And if you don't want to use Federal Reserve notes, then donate with Bitcoin also at thelavaflow.com slash support. Until next time, keep striking the root. Thank you for listening to The Lava Flow at thelavaflow.com. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe now at thelavaflow.com forward slash subscribe. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast.